Hi everyone, we're just getting started. I'm Devika Suresh, Innovation Associate at GFI India, and I'm here with my colleagues, Nicole Roop and Shadul Dabey. We'll be your host for today. We believe this session today will be an excellent primer with the latest insights from the world of alternative seafood, covering topics ranging from the state of the industry to consumer insights and so much more, all conducive to helping you with your proposal. Today, we're extremely happy to announce we're joined by our expert speakers, Marika Azov and Jennifer Lamy. Jen will be joining us in a bit. Marika is the Corporate Engagement Seafood Specialist and leads GFI's Sustainable Seafood Initiative work with startups, investors, conventional seafood companies, and other key players. Jen is the Senior Sustainable Seafood Initiative Manager and manages GFI's cross-programmatic Sustainable Seafood Initiative to ensure that it proceeds strategically and with input and involvement of key stakeholders. Welcome, Marika and Jen. We're super thrilled to have you both here. Before we begin, just a note to all attendees, please use the Q&A box and not the chat feature to ask all your questions pertaining to today's topic to our speakers. We will be taking them at the end of each section of the webinar or at the very end. With that, I'll hand it over to our speakers. Hi, thank you so much for having me. Um, as Devika mentioned, Jen will be joining soon. I'm super excited to talk to you about alternative seafood. Um, I'm based in Brooklyn, New York, but my role is global. And I, um, I spent, I had the pleasure of spending six months in India a couple years ago, and it's a, it's a place very near and dear to my heart. So um, I feel very lucky to be here with all of you today. I'm just gonna share my screen. Let me know if you can't see that. Nope, we can uh, see it. Perfect. Okay, so in today's presentation, um, it's gonna be about an hour. And as Devika mentioned, we'll have about 30 minutes for questions. Um, I'll pause at the end of each section so that you don't have to listen to my voice for a full hour. Um, but and maybe um, Devika or Shardul or someone can kind of help keep track of the questions questions um, so I can um, not be embarrassed at my inability to multitask because <laughs> it's hard to see the, the chat in presentation mode. Um, so in my presentation, I'm going to be introducing alternative seafood, talking about some of its advantages, what the current state of the industry looks like, how consumers view alternative seafood, and opportunities in the industry. And at this point, I think you're all pretty familiar with the Good Food Institute. Um, and while the entire organization works on alternative seafood, we have a special global initiative focused solely on addressing the unique challenges that alternative seafood presents. And that's our sustainable seafood initiative. So what are those challenges? Uh, well, while the entire um, alternative protein industry is seeing tremendous growth internationally, Alternative seafood is a few steps behind alternative terrestrial meat and dairy. So while we can't really know what all of the reasons for this are, a few of the possible explanations could be that A, seafood has a real health halo around it. We have doctors all around the world encouraging patients to consume more seafood, whereas they tend to suggest reducing red meat consumption. We don't see mercury, heavy metal, and microplastic contamination in our seafood, our conventional seafood, really discussed as widely as some of the um, negative impacts of, of terrestrial animal farming, such as antibiotic use and such. And additionally, capturing that kind of flaky, delicate texture of fish, along with the subtle balance of the oceany flavor without making products too fishy, that can be difficult. And that's why our Sustainable Seafood Initiative specifically focuses on accelerating the development of alternative seafood. And we do so within our three programmatic departments, which are corporate engagement, science and technology, and policy. And given the nature of my role, this presentation is focused more heavily on the corporate engagement or industry side. But please feel free to ask policy or science and technology related questions. And if we don't know the answers, I will get them to you after the presentation. So what's alternative seafood? 
Just like other alternative proteins, alternative seafood refers to seafood produced in one or more of the following three ways. So plant-based seafood refers to products created using plant-derived ingredients to replicate the flavor and texture of seafood. Fermentation-derived seafood uses traditional and advanced fermentation technology to grow ingredients or whole products using microorganisms. And cultivated seafood is seafood produced directly from fish or shellfish cells. And why, why is it important to have delicious, accessible, and affordable alternatives to our conventional seafood products? Well, first of all, we know that population growth will continue over the coming decades and will be strongest in low and middle income countries. So this is data from the UN showing the breakdown of where populations will be greatest as we approach 10 billion people on the planet by mid-century. And at the same time, income growth will be largely driven by those countries with the fastest growing populations. So this is a World Bank chart dividing projections for income growth between high GDP countries and low GDP countries. And the blue bars on the top illustrate the massive income growth expected in lower GDP regions. So if we put these two trends together, along with the fact that demand for animal protein increases with income, we get projections that the FAO or the Food and Agriculture Organization and others have come to, which is that we expect about a 30% increase in seafood demand over 2010 levels by 2030. And that's conventional seafood, just to be clear. So how are we gonna meet that growing demand? Well, we know we can't get much more from the oceans than we already do. We have wild caught seafood catch rates have been largely stagnant since about 1990. And as you can see on this graph from the World Resources Institute, they are projected to decline in the coming decades. And the FAO um, estimates that only 7% of global fish stocks are underfished and the rest of the ocean is already fished at maximum capacity. And then we have aquaculture, which has really grown to keep up with the demand for seafood over the past several decades, but projections show that growth slowing. A 2017 study from the FAO assessed the growth potential of aquaculture against demand projections and found that only 17 countries are expected to successfully meet seafood demands with aquaculture leaving about um, 170 countries with substantial unmet demand. So if we want to provide seafood to everyone who wants it and to be able to feed our global population, we need to think bigger. And that's where alternative seafood comes in. So alternative seafood gives us the opportunity to diversify and supplement the total global supply of seafood. And it offers new forms of seafood production to help meet the growing demand. And I should note, it's a massively untapped market white space. So we have, you know, the impossible burger being consumed in Burger Kings across North America. Um, we have big impossible and beyond as kind of the large household names internationally. Um, but we don't yet have a, a clear winner when it comes to alternative seafood. And just to focus on India for a minute, the, the need for alternative seafood in India is particularly dire. So India is the second largest aquaculture producer in the world, and seafood is one of India's most successful um, export food categories. So seafood production in India shows no sign of slowing down, and in fact, the government is promoting the opposite with the Blue Revolution, um, which supports an increase in fisheries and aquaculture production. So therefore presenting a viable alternative or viable alternatives to conventional seafood in India as soon as possible is critical. I'm gonna pause there for a moment. I saw a couple of questions come in. Um, actually, no, those are just um, the chat. So does anyone have any, any questions or have I missed anything? No, I think we're good, Marika. We can get uh, Awesome. Perfect. So a lot of the concerns that we currently associate with wild capture fishing are completely eliminated um, in the production processes of seafood made from plants through fermentation or um, cultivating cells. So in the next few slides, I'm gonna outline some of these environmental concerns 
associated with wild caught fishing um, that are not relevant to alternative seafood. So first of all, there is a finite number of fish in the ocean. And while there are some examples of successful fisheries management programs, we really can't expect to increase the supply of seafood using our wild, um, our wild caught fisheries. The FAO, as I mentioned, estimates that only about 7% of fisheries around the world are underfished and that the rest of them are either overfished or fished to their maximum capacity. And in addition, the, the main driver of greenhouse gas emissions in wild capture fishing is fuel use. So large vessels with intensive capture systems are traveling farther, um, and that's in large part due to the depletion of coastal fisheries. So they have to go farther out, therefore using more fuel. And thirdly, we have bycatch, which is the unintended, unreported, and often unused um, catch of birds, turtles, sea mammals, juvenile fish, and other species that aren't targeted. So that bycatch represents, um, by some estimates, over 40% of the entire global fish catch. And habitat destruction really extends beyond bycatch. So destructive fishing methods affect more than target fish stocks and may be the second biggest threat to all ocean ecosystems after climate change. The coral reefs, which harbor 25% of ocean fish species, despite just covering 0.1% of the seafloor, provide up to 400 billion US dollars in economic benefits each year. And coral reefs, as we all probably know, are very easily damaged by bottom trawling, which is a common method of industrial fishing. And the ocean is really a powerful mediator of climate change. It absorbs about a quarter of the carbon that humans emit into the atmosphere. But some recent studies have shown that with bottom trawling, which again is a popular method of industrial fishing, the amount of carbon in the ocean is increasing. It's kind of stirring up that carbon. And excess carbon in the ocean can lead to ocean acidification that will make it uninhabitable for sea life. And while, while we've come to understand terrestrial animal proteins, high um, greenhouse gas emissions, many seafood species are actually quite high emitters as well. So these are the results of a report from SINTEF, which is a large independent research organization in Europe. And the authors compared the average emissions of beef, pork, and poultry to the average emissions of several seafood species pr produced and consumed in Norway. So this graph standardizes the emissions against beef emissions. And as you can see, uh, salmon and shrimp emissions fall between pork and poultry. And when we remove beef and look specifically at seafood relative to pork, the image becomes even clearer. Um, and what are, what are the sources of these emissions? Well, as, I, as I mentioned, um, wild capture fishery emissions are dominated by fishing vessel fuel use. And in aquaculture, emissions are largely dominated by feed inputs. So, you know, there is still growth potential in aquaculture, but as I mentioned, the, the, there are projections showing that growth slowing down and it's really a, a risky investment. So a 2019 report from FAIR, a global investor network focused on risk and opportunity in protein supply chains, kind of outline the 10 major short, medium, and long-term risks of investing in aquaculture. And the, the short-term risks are those that are already impacting production costs. So one example is the prevalence of disease in aquaculture, which has led to numerous examples of large fish mortality incidents. The medium-term risks are those that are already having an impact in some, but not all regions. Um, or risks that are expected to become more severe in the next few years. And the longer term costs such as shortages of feed supply are those estimated to become even more severe in three to four years or longer. So in addition to the environmental benefits of alternative seafood, alternative seafood has many market advantages as well. So when we talk about the factors that influence consumer purchasing behavior, we talk about price, taste, and convenience. 
And on the convenience front, alternative seafood production isn't limited to coastal regions the way that a lot of the conventional industry is. So as I mentioned, one of the biggest fuel um, contributors to the environmental footprint that um, conventional seafood has is the fuel use of the fishing vessels. So alternative seafood can be produced in the middle of the country in a landlocked area. It's not limited to a coastal region. And some of the benefits of this include cheaper transportation and refrigeration costs and less incidence of spoilage, which is already a huge issue that the conventional industry faces. And one, one current barrier to consumers is the high cost of alternative protein products, right? They tend to cost more than the conventional versions. But with seafood, conventional seafood is often more expensive than some of the more widely consumed terrestrial meats, such as chicken. And therefore, there's an opportunity for alternative seafood to reach price parity with conventional seafood more quickly. And lastly, the conventional fishing industry, mainly the wild caught side, can be volatile, volatile and faces challenges of inconsistent supply. So alternative seafood can be produced in response to demand and therefore can better withstand supply and demand shocks, such as global pandemics. And lastly, um, I just wanted to highlight that cultivated seafood does have several technical advantages over other cultivated meat. And therefore, there's potential for it to reach the global market before cultivated terrestrial meat. Um, of course, we already have cultivated chicken in Singapore, but um, kind of beyond that, there's a lot of a lot of reasons to believe that um, cultivated seafood will kind of reach the rest of the global market earlier. So overall, fish muscle tissue may be better suited for bioreactor cultivation than mammalian tissues given the ability of fish tissues to one, endure low oxygen conditions, which reduces the need for active oxygenation, 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 oh my God, oxygenation, excuse me, in oxygen limited bioreactor environments. Uh, two, the fish cells can tolerate pH ranges, um, potentially establishing a wider range of pH in which cell growth is feasible. And lastly, the fish cells can grow at lower temperatures, which potentially could reduce the heat transfer needs of bioreactor cultivation at scale and therefore reducing production costs. So I don't see any questions yet. Please don't be shy. Feel free to pipe in, chime in if you have any, but I will continue. Um, so in the next few slides, I'm gonna dive into what the alternative seafood commercial landscape looks like. So in 2020 and the first half of 2021, there were at least 87 companies developing alternative seafood globally. And a lot of these uh, stats and figures are in our um, state of the industry report that was recently published and covers alternative seafood, the alternative seafood industry from 2020 and the first half of 2021. Um, and I'll, I'll share those, um, I'll share that report with Shardul and Devika after this so, to make sure that you have access to it. So of those 87 companies developing alternative seafood, the vast majority were, are developing plant-based products followed by cultivated and then fermentation derived. And as you can see, the majority of these companies are located in North America and in Europe. And this map kind of gives us a better visual representation of where alternative seafood companies and startups are headquartered. There's plenty of room to continue expanding in all regions. Uh, seafood preferences among consumers vary greatly by region. So there's, there's a need and there's room to create products that suit different markets around the world. And I highlighted here that India um, only has about four companies developing alternative seafood and all of them are plant-based. And, and this is not a comprehensive list. Um, so if any of you know of additional companies producing alternative seafood, please reach out and we'll make sure to add them to the list. But the four we have now are Brew 51, Veggie Champ, Naka, and Seaspire. 
And uh, just to note, CSPIRE came out of the ISPIC uh, 2020 cohort, and they were also recently selected as one of the XPRIZE finalists. So that's pretty exciting and relevant to you all. And this slide here shows the breakdown of the type of seafood products those 87 companies are developing. So as you can see, breaded or battered whitefish is the most common. And these products are appealing to a wide audience. Uh, we see them as being <clears throat> introduced into quick service restaurants. They're easy to prepare. The texture and flavor challenges aren't quite as present with a breaded or battered product because a lot of the flavor comes from that breading. Um, and there are far fewer products that might appeal to a more health conscious consumer who's looking for alternatives to say a white fish or a salmon filet. <clears throat> so we definitely see a market for more products that can accurately mimic the taste, texture, and nutritional content of this type of product. And in the past few years, we've really seen an increase in investment activity in alternative seafood around the world. So this slide shows an overview of recent investment activity for alternative seafood companies globally. And I should note this only includes disclosed amounts, so it's likely significantly understated. Um, it also includes, only includes companies whose sole focus is alternative seafood. So we have companies like Gardein and Corn who produce a whole range of alternative um, protein products, including seafood. And those, those companies are not included here because obviously we can't determine what percentage of those rate investments go to the seafood part of their business. So as you can see here, the first half of 2021 so record investments already exceeding 2020's numbers, and that's as of June of 2021. Um, and there have been 116 million US dollars of invested capital um, as of June 2021, and that excludes liquidity events. It occurred across seven deals with disclosed deal sizes. So in total, there have been 11 disclosed deals, um, and the size of four of those deals were not disclosed. So again, the amount is, is likely significantly understated. I'm excited to see a question. Um, innovative, affordable, cold storage, mech, okay, I'll, I'll read it out loud. Um, from your end, did you see, come across any innovative, affordable, cold storage mechanisms as per today's market other than regular cold storage chambers and commercial refrigerators, something like the portable category? That's a great question. Um, I don't know the answer to it, but um, I see Jen has has joined us. I don't know if if you know the answer to that either, Jen. If so, feel free to chime in. Um, but but we I can definitely reach out to our science technology team and and ask. Awesome. I assume. Yeah, it's not, not something I've, I've uh, focused on, but great question. And I will save it for later to try to get back to you. Awesome, keep the questions coming. Okay, um, oh, sorry. So the majority of this presentation, I really tried to have a global focus um, and to zoom in on India where possible. But unfortunately, we don't have reliable sales data from the US. So in this section, I'm gonna go into, oh, sorry, we don't have reliable sales data um, from anywhere other than the US. Um, so I'm really gonna focus on the US in this section and I'm going to go over the retail sales from 2020. And because cultivated seafood is not yet available in the United States, this data is, pertains only to plant-based sales. So we can see that the plant-based seafood retail sales increased by 23% in 2020. And I should note that, again, this only covers retail sales. And as many of you know, um, the majority of seafood sales in the United States take place in food service. So this is definitely not a full picture of the size of the industry. And despite this $2 million growth, plant-based seafood still remains a small fraction of the overall plant-based meat and seafood category, which in the US was worth $1.4 billion in 2020. However, alternative seafood is, is really well poised to capitalize on the momentum of the rest of the plant-based industry, which is continuing to grow and not just in the United States, it's continuing to grow globally. So at a starting point to kind of help us quantify this opportunity, 
we can look at where plant-based meat is today. The plant-based meat makes up 1.4 of the dollar share amount of all meat products in the US, meaning conventional animal-based meat as well as plant-based meat. So compared to plant-based meats, 1.4%, plant-based seafood makes up only 0.1% of the dollar share amount of all seafood products in the US, which is a $15 billion industry. So to start, just increasing the dollar share amount of seafood by 1.3% so that it's on par with where plant-based meat is today, we're looking at a $221 million opportunity. And the majority of seafood purchases, again, are made away from home. So this opportunity is many times larger when we factor that in, when we factor in the restaurant and food service sales. And then we can take it one step further and compare plant-based seafood's dollar share to that of plant-based milks, which is at 15% of all milk sales. So that's conventional milk and plant-based milk. So for plant-based seafood to reach 15% of total seafood shares, we're looking at a $2.5 billion opportunity. Haven't seen any questions come in, so I will, oh. What are the most, um, what are the major plant protein sources used in development of plant-based seafood? Great question. So it's pretty similar to um, other plant-based meat products. Right now we're seeing soy and wheat as kind of the main um, sources of protein for these products. We're also seeing um, pea protein and we're seeing, um, we're seeing more algal derived products. So one important, um, <clears throat> One important thing for plant-based or all alternative seafood products to contain is the omega-3s because, you know, as a, again, um, consumers purchase or consume seafood largely for the health benefits, which include those omega-3 fatty acids. So we're seeing companies use algal protein, um, whether it's microalgae or seaweed to, um, you know, algal, excuse me, um, to both get that protein content as well as the omega-3s. So that's kind of an opportunity area. It's not, um, we're not seeing a ton of companies using um, algal protein, but we are seeing a lot of companies using algal omega-3s. What are the best methods for extrusion as seafoods have different textures? Great question. And I'm gonna save that because at the end of the presentation, I, I'm gonna just quick kind of quickly dive into the um, plant-based manufacturing techniques. So hold tight on that one. All right, moving on to the next section. Um, in the next couple slides, I'm gonna highlight one company from each production platform. So fermentation derived, plant-based and cultivated, as well as some examples of conventional seafood companies getting on board with alternative seafood. But first we have the uh, US based aquaculture foods using microbial fermentation to produce whole cut seafood products. So their products contain omega threes, they contain 18 to 20 grams of protein per serving, which is comparable to um, the amount of protein in a, in a serving of cod, as well as fiber and a range of B vitamins like B12. Um, to create kind of nutritionally enhanced alternatives that provide nutritional benefits beyond what conventional seafood provides. So with a uh, conventional seafood product, it's rare that you get the B12 vitamins and fiber, um, but that's one, one exciting aspect of all alternative proteins, um, but we're talking about alternative seafood right now is that you can add, you can add nutrients that the conventional versions don't have. Um, and just a few weeks ago, aquacultured foods raised 2.1 million US dollars in an oversubscribed pre-seed round. And they plan to launch in food service um, as well as retail in early 2022. And we have Singapore-based cultivated um, seafood company, Shiok Meats, and they're working on cultivated crustaceans. So they completed a Series A funding round raising 12.6 million US dollars in September of 2020. And they plan to launch a minced shrimp product in 2022, depending on, um, oh, sorry, scratch that. Um, yes, they plan on launching a minced shrimp product in 2022. And last July, they partnered with a Japanese company, Integ Integriculture, 
to work with Shiok on developing an inexpensive growth serum in order to produce their product more efficiently and inexpensively. Then in the plant-based world, we have Vienna-based Revo Foods, which was founded in 2020, in 2020. And they use 3D technology to mimic the complex, complex structure of whole cuts of fish. Um, so their initial products, which they just launched in retail, um, are salmon strips and salmon spreads. And, and those don't yet have the, the same whole cut resemblance to seafood. So they're not created, developed using the 3D technology, um, but they are developing a prototype of salmon and tuna sashimi, which they say will have the complex bite and structure of real fish as a result of the 3D technology. Uh, they plan to launch um, they plan to launch their initial plant-based seafood products more widely in the market later this year, um, as well as rolling out to other European markets while continuing to develop their 3D um, whole cut structure fillets. So given the size of the global market opportunity that Alternative Seafood presents, we're starting to see increased attention on Alternative Seafood from large food companies including the incumbent or the conventional meat and seafood industry. So here are just a few of the companies and incumbent players that have launched, have either launched their own alternative seafood products or brands. Um, and and as, we, as we strive to make alternative seafood more delicious, more affordable and more accessible, it's super crucial to bring companies like these along for the alternative seafood ride. So they have massive R&D budgets, manufacturing capacity, established supply chains and distribution channels. Um, and the incumbent seafood industry players also bring to the table their extensive sensory knowledge of conventional seafood. So what it's supposed to taste like, smell like, um, what the texture is supposed to be like. So in the next two slides, I'm going to highlight two of these companies. So first we have Thai-based conventional seafood company, Thai Union, which has been increasingly more active in the alternative meat and seafood space. They're a member of the Smart Protein Consortium, which is a partnership between 30 plus universities, research institutions, corporations, and nonprofits that are seeking to develop the next generation of proteins. In 2021, they launched the OMG Meat Line in Thailand, which offers a range of plant-based products including crab meat and fish nuggets. And they say they got into the plant-based market because of a clear demand from their customers. Um, and they've also expressed their excitement about producing plant-based seafood because of their expertise in conventional seafoods, taste and texture. And they're planning to, oh, sorry, they actually already launched um, a plant-based shrimp a couple months ago. It's a, it's a minced shrimp. Uh, they've recently gotten involved in the cultivated seafood space by investing in the cultivated seafood company Blue Nalu. Um, and they also signed a memorandum of understanding with Blue Nalu, which is designed to assess market development strategies for Blue Nalu's cultivated seafood, specifically in Asia. <clears throat> and I've included this quote in the blue box because I think it highlights the sentiments of the incumbent meat and seafood companies who are realizing kind of the significant role that alternative seafood can play in our global markets. So we have Thai Union's global innovation director said that sustaining ocean life while also being able, able to deliver nutrition to consumers around the world is a key focus for the Global Innovation Center and Thai Union. And it's important that we are able to maintain a leading position in this area. And it's not just the big name players that are capitalizing on this opportunity. Uh, the plant-based seafood co was started by the small family owned conventional seafood company Van Cleave in 2019. And recently they spun the plant-based portion of their company into its own company, the plant-based seafood co. And that was due to massive interest in their products. Their mind blown coconut shrimp was named the most disruptive product of 2020 at the prepared food spirit of innovation awards. And in 2021, they announced a partnership with wholesale marketplace pod foods for us retail launch this past spring. They're also planning to phase out their conventional seafood business to focus fully on their plant-based line 
and transition their conventional operations to seaweed farming. I see we have some questions. <clears throat> Um, how cost effective are the retail are the three D based products? Can we retail the same at the current um, costing? So the I believe um, the three D technology is still in the prototype phase. Um, so I don't know if we know yet, but I can I can save that question as well and reach out to our our science and technology team to see if they have more information. But great question. Um, Let's see, as we do not have alternative seafood products in India, my question is with respect to the texture of the currently available alternative seafood products like lobster, crab, salmon across the globe. How close are these to the original seafood? Um, and you're welcome. <laughs> so that's a great question. And it's, it's, it's hard to know. Um, we're, we're really excited. We just, part, we just commissioned a sensory study um, a couple uh, that will be available probably early next year. And this study compared three different categories of seafood, of conventional seafood to their plant-based counterparts. So we did canned tuna, shrimp, and breaded whitefish. And the study included kind of untrained consumer panelists who were just judging the different products based on their likability. And then we also had a group of trained sensory experts that were kind of rating um, or grading the different sensory attributes on a scale um, to compare the plant-based versions to the conventional versions. So we anecdotally, from our own experience and from others' experience, kind of know um, how, how these products hold up to the conventional versions. Um, but this study will really help us have more concrete information um, and also some kind of actionable, actionable results that we can share with companies. Um, so that's a great question. And like I said, so far, there hasn't been a, a clear winner in, in plant-based seafood um, in the way we have, you know, Impossible and Beyond as kind of the clear front runners in terrestrial meat. Oh, I see another one. How do the upcoming plant-based seafood products fare when cooked? What can be, that's a great question. Um, it, again, it depends on the product. Uh, they have different, different cooking techniques. Um, some are to be fried, some are raw. Um, so so it, it really depends. Um, a lot of the companies are prioritizing, um, are trying to ensure that cooking these alternatives is pretty as similar as possible to cooking the conventional versions. So whether that's the amount of time in the deep fryer, so that if say McDonald's were to swap their um, conventional breaded fish fillet for a alternative one, there wouldn't be the need for a lot of different equipment or training of staff. So that's definitely something um, that a lot of the startups and companies in the space are taking into consideration. And what are the other micro microbial sources utilized for fermentation derived seafoods other than algae? Um, we have, there are different fungi used. Um, I don't know the specific names of them. Jen, let me know if you have any, any answers to this specific was, question. Yeah, I would just recommend that folks check out the state of the industry report that GFI put out um, earlier this year on fermentation and I'll drop the link, but I think that's probably your best source for kind of digging into exactly how that's all happening. Awesome, thank you. Um, and what can be the major source of protein that can be used in the plant-based seafood alternatives and what are the major factors to fix the texture of seafood alternatives? Um, so, so again, the, the major sources right now um, are, are wheat and soy with pea protein there as well, and then the algal proteins. Um, and the major factors to fix the texture of seafood alternatives, that's a great question. Um, as I mentioned earlier, it, getting that kind of flaky whitefish texture is really is proving to be more difficult um, than you know a minced or ground texture. <clears throat> we're also we're seeing companies um, 
kind of working on raw sushi or sashimi alternatives. Um, some of those have, have been more successful than others. Um, so again, I'm going to go into some of the, the um, technical manufacture, the manufacturing techniques and kind of which ones are the most advanced um, and which ones need, need the most um, attention and focus. So hopefully that will help answer that question. Um, and please explain the method of extraction of extracting protein from algae. That's a great question and one that I don't know the answer to. Um, so I'm happy to see what resources we have on that and share them at the end. Um, Hi, Monica, sorry, I'm gonna butt in here, sorry. Um, yeah. Done a, GFI India has done a strategic analysis on um, um, microalgae and seaweed. I'm just gonna link in the resource over here as well. And I'd encourage you to go through it. It's an extensive 60 page report um, and will answer a lot of your questions related to algae. Thank you so much. Yes, and I completely forgot to mention that report has been huge um, and a, a really helpful source um, for a lot of folks. So I highly recommend taking a look at that. Thank you, Marika. Okay. Just quickly adding one more insight as well to one of the questions just to supplement what you and Nicole added earlier. Um, there were a couple of questions around going about choosing a specific species or which one to go for, right, in terms of commercial sense. So I guess it really depends on what your objective is. If you're asking this question because you want to start a plant-based production, a plant-based seafood production company or a startup, then I guess you should focus firstly on the kind of target market you're catering to. And in a country like India, let's say, you know, Rohu might be a fish which is prominent in one state versus say a Bangla, which might be a more prominent fish in some other state, right? And um, again, you'll have to kind of understand and apply 80-20 in terms of those decisions that which are the first few uh, perhaps species of seafood uh, or fish that you might want to focus on. And also is the ease of uh, replicating the textures for the same, right? Um, some seafood categories, even though they might be popular, might be quite difficult to replicate or, uh, you know, mimic in terms of texture, taste. And you'll have to take a call based on the availability of ingredients currently, because theoretically you can do probably anything. But, uh, <clears throat> and, <clears throat> sorry, and a lot of your solutions are also probably th theoretical at this point of the challenge. But if you really want to actualize those and implement those in terms of, uh, you know, especially track two as an entrepreneur in the plant-based seafood or alternative seafood category, I think you have to account uh, for your decisions and, you know, your reasoning throughout the proposal based on kind of these parameters. Yeah, thank, thank you, Marika. I just wanted to quickly add that in. No, thank you. And Shardul, you're, you're more of an expert on that than I am. So please feel free, um, all the all of you in GFI India to pipe in. This is um, definitely a group effort here. Um, I'll, I'll also mention that it kind of depends on, again, as Shardul said, your target market. We're seeing some companies targeting high value species like a, a bluefin tuna um, to, to launch into food service first. Um, you know, they, having a, a high cost, uh, a species that um, is highly valued and rare um, can really help generate a lot of exciting buzz around the product and also help reach price parity first. Um, also putting, putting the preparation of these products into the hands of trained chefs at first can be very beneficial um, to make sure that they you know, can ensure that they're cooked properly and flavored properly so that consumers um, want to come back and want to continue to purchase alternative seafood. Um, but we're also seeing companies, you know, prioritizing kind of the, the cheaper, like fish balls or ground products that, um, that are easier to um, mimic the texture and the taste of. So again, it really depends on the market that you're targeting. Awesome. So I'm going to move into our consumer insights section. Um, and there's, there's very little alternative seafood specific consumer research available globally, but in 2020 GFI commissioned a US specific alternative seafood consumer research study. Um, and you can view the entire report on our website. I'll send that link out to you at the end of this presentation. Uh, we're currently working on similar research in four Asia Pacific countries, which is Singapore, Japan, South Korea, and um, oh my God. Singapore, Japan, South Korea, Jen, help me out. 
Thailand. Got it. Sorry. <laughs> um, and so those those results should be published by the end of the year. Um, and while, again, this consumer research is not focused on the Indian consumer, it is the most relevant seafood specific consumer research we have. So I hope it will be useful. So in 2020, we hired Kelton Global to survey 2,500 US consumers. And each participant was asked preliminary questions about their seafood consumption, their other dietary preferences. And then they were split into groups that plant-based and cultivated groups. They were then provided with a brief introduction to that technology platform. And each group was then asked a series of questions about either plant-based or cultivated seafood motivations and barriers. So the main takeaway from this research was that taste followed by some other sensory characteristics is by far the most important characteristic for consumers when deciding to eat any seafood, um, whether it's conventional or alternative. Participants cited price as the most significant barrier to consuming conventional seafood. And they cited taste, texture, and accessibility of products as the most significant barriers to consuming plant-based seafood. So while cultivated seafood is not yet available in the US, consumers cited taste and texture as hypothetical leading barriers to cultivated seafood consumption. And consumers were grouped into three categories, alternative seafood rejector, alternative seafood interested, or alternative seafood enthusiast, based on how appealing they found and how likely they were to purchase either plant-based or cultivated seafood. So here we can see how each group of prospective alternative seafood buyers breaks down by dietary preferences. And notably, a large amount of pescatarians and flexitarians are interested in or enthusiastic about alternative seafood, and they're, they're pretty unlikely to be rejectors of alternative seafood. And alternative seafood enthusiasts have a greater tendency to try new products than all other consumers, while alternative seafood rejectors tend to stick to what they know and avoid substitutions. So this speaks to both the value of alternative seafood kind of tapping into novelty for those early adopters, but it also signifies the importance of achieving familiarity in order to appeal to the alternative seafood rejectors. And we also see that the majority of consumers consider themselves knowledgeable about health and nutrition. So this suggests that focusing on health and health messaging plays a role in successful early adoption of alternative seafood products. So this is a total unduplicated research and frequency analysis or a turf analysis. And really what it does is it, de is it demonstrates ideal messaging to reach the maximum number of consumers. So taste again is table stakes for plant-based seafood and cultivated seafood, which I'll show in the following slide. And messaging about products, environmental health and functional benefits can bring additional consumers into the category once that good flavor and is achieved. So for plant-based seafood, the most compelling environmental messaging is on the reduction of overfishing, while the most compelling health benefits are around omega-3 fatty acids. And once consumers have a positive impression of alternative seafood flavor, messaging focused on these benefits um, is likely to make products more appealing to consumers. So we, we see the same overall results from the cultivated turf analysis, the only differences being the, spe the specifics of the environmental and health messaging. So for cultivated seafood, messaging about the product's ocean habitat benefits, protein content, lack of fishy smell, and reduction in plastic waste produ produced by ocean fishing can also bring additional consumers into the category after the flavor is achieved. Oh, wow, I see Jen and co have been on fire responding to these questions. So um, thank you. I'm going to continue on to the last section, which is our opportunities section. So one of one of the core ways that GFI supports the alternative protein space is by identifying white space opportunities and sharing them with the right audiences. So in this final section, I'm going to speak about some of the opportunities in alternative seafood. 
So most plant-based seafood products available for purchase around the world are either shelf stable or frozen. But when we look at the global trends from 1962 to 2018 on the left here, we see that fresh and frozen fish and shellfish make up the majority of the seafood sold in the world. And those segments are only continuing to grow. Again, we only have retail, uh, reliable retail sales data from the US. Um, so in the US, the, in 2019, zero dollar sales came from the refrigerated section and the category was dominated by frozen products. So as technologies continue to improve, we really hope to see a lot more focus on refrigerated plant-based seafood or refrigerated alternative seafood in order to reach those consumers who buy fresh or chilled conventional seafood and who are kind of shopping for these products in the refrigerated um, section or the, the seafood counter or market. And I see an omega-3 question coming in. I'll read it in a moment, but hopefully this, this helps. Um, I kind of touched on it earlier, but really in order to appeal to those health conscious consumers, alternative seafood products should contain similar omega-3 fatty acid contents um, especially DHA and EPA, to their conventional counterparts. So at the moment, animal-free omega-3 ingredients can be expensive, they can be inconsistent, and a lot of alternative seafood com companies are purchasing supplement-grade omega-3s, which are sold at a premium um, and you know, prohibit these companies from reaching price parity as quickly. So we see um, an opportunity in scaling up the animal-free omega-3 production. Um, and we see that as being really critical to the success of the alternative seafood market. And additionally, we see an opportunity to add these animal-free omega-3s to other alternative proteins such as beef or chicken. And that's to create those nutritionally enhanced products that, that make these products um, more desirable to consumers. So while there are not plenty of fish in the sea anymore, there are plenty of different species of fish in the sea. So we eat 200 to 300 different species of seafood around the world. And as you saw in that chart early on in my presentation, companies, alternative seafood companies are really only making a handful of them so far. And there are a whole myriad of different species consumed um, in different parts of the world, right? So I'm sure Dual touched on this as well. Um, India is a massive, massive country. So there are opportunities to produce different alternative seafood products um, in different areas of the country. And as we saw in the consumer research, it's incredibly necessary for alternative seafood products to achieve taste and texture parity with conventional seafood. So with more ma sophisticated manufacturing methods, which I'll get into in the, the next slide, it's possible to create the layers of fat, layers of collagen and protein that give fish its desirable taste, texture and cooking properties. And we're really seeing amazing innovation in this space every day. Companies are continuing to raise the bar, um, but again, there is still a need for a, a clear alternative seafood winner, um, which, which we don't yet have. So I'm gonna quickly go into some of those, um, the kind of advanced plant-based manufacturing techniques. And this chart, I think will be helpful for you all to look at more in depth um, when we send you the slide deck, but it includes the structuring techniques that are most applicable for replicating the sensory characteristics of conventional seafood using plant-based proteins. So I'm not gonna read everything, um, but some of the key takeaways are that extrusion, both high and low moisture, um, is the most established technology. And it's excellent at producing minced and ground products such as crab cakes or fish strips. Then we have shear cell technology, which is still in the pilot stage. And it's ideal for producing thick sheets of, homo of homogeneous, products like white fish fillets. Then we have 3D printing, which is still in the prototype phase as well. And it's best used where precise control and layering is needed, such as in a salmon fillet, um, which you know, has those layers of fat and protein. Then fiber spinning techniques are also in the prototype phase and are potentially useful for developing fibers 
at scales that are that resemble muscle fibers. So it could be useful for adding fiber integrity to whole cuts of cultivated meat as well. Um, and then lastly, there are a few startups and companies using whole vegetables like a tomato, a carrot, eggplant to mimic the texture of raw seafood and to provide kind of a less processed alternative seafood product. So if you leave this webinar and only remember one thing, the, the main takeaway is that while alternative seafood is seeing tremendous growth globally, especially in the past two years, it's still a massive white space industry and has yet to take off in India the way it has in Europe and the US. It's an incredibly exciting time to enter this space. We're seeing more and more media focus on this space. Um, and as the Indian government continues to promote an increase in fisheries and aquaculture production, um, we're really in urgent need of delicious, affordable, and excessive, uh, sorry, accessible alternative seafood products. So that concludes my presentation. I see lots of good questions um, that I'll answer in a moment. Uh, please sign up for our newsletters. I'll link all of this in an email. I'll send to Shardul and Devika. Um, but this here, we have an alternative seafood specific newsletter and then a more general one. Um, I'll, and um, yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stop sharing my screen so we can move on to the Q&A and, and I'll invite um, Jen to come on, on the screen if, if you want. One moment. Thank you, Marika, for a wonderful presentation. We can actually invite the participants. If you have any questions, just raise your hands. If, if you don't want to type it, I'll have you on the screen and you know you can basically call question. You can talk about the ideas you're working on and perhaps how uh, you know our experts because can help think help you think better about whatever problem areas you're you know looking to focus on within seafood and um, the kind of innovation you're trying to bring about given the problem statements and space opportunity areas and track management. Wonderful. Thank you, Shardul. Um, I'm gonna start with answering these questions, but please feel free um, to, to chime in and we can have a more interactive session after. Um, okay, we already answered that one. Um, Hi, with regards to seafood, which source plant-based cultivated or fermentation derived oh, mimic closest in terms of taste, price, texture, and convenience? Great question. Um, right now, products use uh, products developed um, using plant-based and fermentation derived technologies are, you know, the most widely available because uh, cultivated seafood or cultivated meat in general is, is only, um, has only been launched in Singapore. So those definitely mimic um, closest in terms of price and convenience. Um, and there, you know, there, we get asked this question a lot, like which is the most promising production method? And we really see opportunities for all of them. Um, when it comes to really getting the, the texture and the um, nutritional content down, we see, we see tremendous potential in cultivated seafood. Um, for plant-based, you know, a lot of companies are doing really, really exciting and innovative things. Um, and, you know, while we see kind of creating a minced crab cake or um, a canned tuna, those being really, um, really successful in terms of plant-based and fermentation derived. Um, Jen, I don't know if you have any anything to add on that one. No, I think I would just echo what you said that, you know, it definitely depends on what you're looking at. You know, when we think about sort of getting a really close product in terms of sensory experience and nutrition, uh, we might end up seeing that cultivated is the way to go, but it'll take longer to get the price down. Um, so just thinking through sort of the, the pros and cons, and obviously it depends on the product that you're looking at as well. You know, if we're trying to do something like a less expensive product versus a more expensive, you know, bluefin tuna, um, then you need to think a little bit about the, the cost structure behind the alternative version, at least in the shorter term or whenever um, sort of the, the hope is to go to market. Um, so yeah, I think 
I think it is something you kind of have to think through on a, on a product by product and sort of a timeline by timeline basis. Thanks, Jen. Um, will it be possible to obtain vitamin B12 from plants, plant-based sources um, so that we can add to our seafood? Yes, there is plant-based B, vitamin B12. Um, I don't know a lot about that market. Um, I don't know if we have, I don't know if Shardul or anyone else on the call um, knows, has more information on that, but it's definitely possible. I take it every morning. Um, I imagine similar to omega threes, probably a majority of companies use kind of supplement grade B12. Um, I don't know if there's as like an established supply chain specific to, to alternative proteins, adding B12 to alternative proteins. Um, but anyone else can chime in if they have more information than I do. The only other thing that I would add to that is that it is available in some like whole food plant sources as well. Um, I think certain mushrooms, um, definitely, uh, now I can't think of any others, of course, as I uh, try to list examples, but there are several as well. So, you know, you can kind of go in different directions, whether it's sort of an isolated um, uh, supplement to add versus, you know, something um, from coming directly from a plant. Um, I think there are a lot of options for bringing that into products. And I, I certainly think it's a, a good idea to think about sort of everything that consumers expect nutritionally from a seafood product. Yeah, nutritional yeast, um, I think some sort of uh, seaweed, including uh, nori seaweed, et cetera, also has B12. So uh, basically uh, people who are looking to address this specific uh, problem in the seafood value chain would have to think about what are the sources available. And in most cases you'd kind of find out. And again, the resource given by Nicole earlier uh, about, you know, somebody asked about protein extraction from algae. I think it's worth reading in terms of the technologies available for extraction of not just protein, but also other biofunctional ingredients, which are quite valuable and would be kind of necessary to bring the seafood products at par with their conventional uh, counterparts in terms of alternative seafoods. So I guess what you're trying to really understand here is, and this is obviously applicable for plant-based, right? Um, in case of cultivated, etc., uh, you might perhaps tap into that source directly because you're growing the entire species and cells therein. So the methods of producing those individual components would differ for both of those technology areas, but ultimately you'll follow a similar approach of figuring out in case of plants, what are some other sources where it's available abundantly and then perhaps looking at some sort of innovation and manufacturing, extraction and delivery systems, which would enable perhaps the end product to have a more wholesome nutritional profile. Thanks, Shardul. Um, and maybe you have more insight into this next question than I do um, about bioavailability. Uh, many are using cod liver oil as a source of vitamin A as they are more bioavailable. Can you explain more about the bioavailability of alternative seafood? I assume um, this person means kind of the bioavailability of um, these different vitamins and um, nutrients such as omega-3s and vitamin A. Um, I, don't, um, I don't know the answer to this question. <laughs> I know that there is some question around cooking techniques and, you know, a lot of a lot of these animal free omega-3 products um, that you know, are, are bioavailable when taken as supplements. Uh, we're not totally sure how they hold up when um, cooked different ways. So there's definitely a need for more research on that. Um, but if, if anyone else has insight into this, please feel free to chime yeah, in or I can- I can, can drop some thoughts in. Um, so in general, the parts it's correct, right? For plant-based proteins, the bioavailability parameters like PDCAS score and, you know, um, recently people have started focusing on DIS scores. And, uh, you know, if you see some of the webinars that GFI has, because these has a lot of parameters uh, in question, right? The long version of this would require a lot of explanation of different parameters, which are lead to understanding of somebody in terms of what are the different parameters that affect bioavailability? What are the innovation areas possible there? But the answer is in general, the plants, the products that are coming to market would have reduced bioavailability of a lot of these ingredients. And there is a drastic need for scientists and entrepreneurs to focus on ventures, whereby you can claim perhaps that your nutritional profile is as good or perhaps even better than the products that are currently being offered. And that only happens with time in an industry as uh, perhaps the 
today's price and convenience factors are solved by more and more people people will start focusing on uh, macronutrients and micronutrients uh, 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 profiles and how we can replicate that specific to a seafood species in many case for example uh, companies which are extracting protein you know your ingredient suppliers with which are you know an entrepreneur might work ultimately or a scientist might decide to work in the organization if or if you're a researcher or a student uh, what they are focusing on is uh, making sure that their proteins are more and more bioavailable whether it's through cleaner extraction methods more efficient extraction methods or perhaps considering sources of that similar protein or similar uh, biofunctional ingredient which is perhaps better uh, and more suitable to a certain uh, currently available conventionally available extraction pro process now um, so that's what i think that's where the ip is and given the novel nature of the sector extraction and ingredient companies have created plant based proteins which are very very bioavailable right in terms of how much they are uh, absorbed in your body so i think similar approach has to be followed for not just proteins but the ingredients as well Thank you, Shardul. I shouldn't have even attempted on that one. <laughs> Very helpful information. Um, I think, Jen, Jen, do you want to answer the question about um, how to convince, uh, I'll read it out loud. Since the plant-based ingredients are processed using one of the methods that I outlined, people can be a little skeptical um, about the use, about processed foods. How can we convince people on this? Yeah, I think there are a few different things to keep in mind here. So, um, you know, one importantly is that some consumers are concerned about processed foods, but others are not, um, you know, there's some kind of processing that's been involved in the majority of the food that, you know, people have eaten for sort of the, a very long time. Um, so I think it's worth sort of thinking about the fact that, you know, people eat current conventional fish seafood that is, um, you know, very commonly processed in some way. And, and people often will eat um, that kind of food sort of despite how it's uh, produced and not like for the production process. Um, but that being said, there are definitely consumers who are interested in, um, you know, the kind of shorter ingredient lists or minimally processed foods. Um, and we're definitely seeing um, that be sort of a, a trend, um, though maybe on the small side, but definitely happening sort of uh, around the world in, in various scales. So for those, I think, I think it is important to just think about the fact that there can be different products for different audiences, and that can even happen from the same company. You know, we've seen uh, plant-based burger companies come out with kind of their, their more uh, sort of indulgent version of their product, and then a somewhat healthier version um, that has higher fiber and lower saturated fat, and some of those. Um, so I think you can kind of think about that sort of broadly nutritionally, but definitely in terms of processing where you can have something that sort of, you know, fits the space of seafood, but isn't necessarily um, as close a fit as kind of something that caters to those consumers. But I think for the vast majority of consumers, some processing to, to get us to the point where, you know, we have the, the delicious and affordable and available product that, you know, consumers consistently um, sort of make their purchasing decisions based on um, will, will really end up being a, a successful product. Thank you, Jen. Um, and I see that uh, Devika mentioned, uh, answered the question on um, cultivated meat regulation. And that's awesome that there's, there's a webinar on this. I'm also gonna pop a link in the chat um, that our policy team, it's a, a link to a blog post that our policy team wrote kind of about the um, global cultivated meat regulation, or the status of it. So um, hopefully that will be helpful as well as, um, as that webinar. Thank you so much, Monica. Okay. Just an additional thought there. Uh, for example, if you're asking this question from an entrepreneur's perspective, you do have to kind of keep it in mind the novel nature of the sector altogether, whether it's cultivated meat or cultivated seafood, and then kind of uh, factor in that in your plans of when investors ask you about regulation, that currently the global landscape is evolving as we know. Um, obviously, um, GFI and other organizations that are focusing on these areas want to see progressive regulatory framework for these areas and hopefully uh, India will catch up with other countries as well in terms of making those decisions but it's like cryptocurrency in many ways in different countries to draw a parallel right uh, you know sometimes there are no laws or regulations governing a lot of the applications but the underlying technology of blockchain perhaps be there somewhat similar in this area I guess if you thinking from a perspective of a researcher or a scientist it's no time better than 
now to actually start thinking about the problems in the sector and kind of uh, worry not too much about the regulation because perhaps the scientific advancement will lead to more and more practical products and offerings in the markets uh, but also perhaps let all these kind of joint creators who are proven working on proving a lot of these technology around consumption of these products safety or standing of where the current landscape is at and where it's kind of going thank you thank you shardul any other questions? Anything people want to share with us? Um, you know, the, the conversation definitely doesn't have to end here. Jen and I are here to support you all, here to answer questions. Um, I'm gonna type my email in the in the chat and I'll, uh, Devika and Shardul, I'll, I'll send a, a list of resources to you both to, to disseminate to all to the audience. Um, but we're really, really excited um about about the potential about all of your projects your potential proposals um so please keep us in the loop and reach out if we can support you in any way thank you so much marika and jen it was a wonderful session indeed and i'm sure all our participants are grateful for the direct line of sight that they're getting into the alternative seafood world so thank you for that we can take any last questions if anyone else has anything to add anything to share you can also raise your hand and we can um, have you share directly with our speakers as well. Yeah, I think those would be the list of questions. We can perhaps follow up with uh, Jen and Marika as a uh, aftermath of the webinar. Thank you so much again, uh, Jen and Marika, for taking the time out. And uh, I'm sure with the previous year's uh, webinar and this webinar, uh, people working on the seafood, alternative seafood category will have a much better base in terms of getting started and thinking about their innovative ideas, which will do, which they will do over the next uh, you know, few weeks. And uh, hopefully we see some innovative proposals in the category and we'll keep you in loop. Thank you so much once again. Thank you. Both. Thank you.